RS 2019-100, Mendez and Hancock. Um, it is issues general obligation bonds of the metropolitan government in the aggregate principal amount not to exceed $1 million. And should we do this one and the next one together? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, um, if there's no objection, take this one and the next one together. The next one is Resolution RS 2019-116, Mendez-Hancock, affirms the authority of the Metropolitan Government to issue general obligation bonds pursuant to that certain initial resolution previously adopted by the Metro Council and consenting to particular allocations for specific works projects. So, is there a motion? Move. All right, so um, several people in the queue. Start with uh, Councilmember Allen. Thank you. We sort of went over this before, but just for clarification, can you kind of walk through the steps of when we actually issue a bond and when we authorize and, and what where in this this piece of legislation is, and also when we decide we're going to fund stuff, just kind of how those steps progress. Sure, I'll take a crack at that and then have uh, um, Mr. Cooper clean up anything that I mess up. Um, so uh, the council for many years, um, after it approves what's called an initial resolution um, for the capital spending, um, uh, when it comes time to actually um, build a project, um, the money is drawn from the commercial paper line. Um, and uh, one of the purposes of that is uh, to make sure that we don't have to go to the bond market um, uh, too frequently when conditions aren't appropriate. And so the practices that the commercial paper line is used for week in and week out capital spending. And then when bond condition, bond market conditions are favorable, there's a bond issuance that is made um, that essentially um, cleans out, empties out, pays off the commercial paper line and um, and, and bonds are issued instead and, and bonds are, are due usually over 20 to 30 years. So for example, we might do uh, um, have $300 million worth of approved um, capital spending and a capital spending plan through one of these initial resolutions, and then um, uh, $200 million of the spending needs to take place. That money is drawn from the commercial paper line. Bond conditions are then deemed favorable. There's a bond issuance for $2 million, $200 million. Um, it, it puts the balance on the commercial paper down to zero, and then there's bonds that are due for $200 million. Mr. Cooper, did I get that about right? That's correct. Um, so the second part of that question about where we're at right now is that, so this is a, there's a 2013 initial um, resolution that approved um, uh, certain capital spending, including $18 million, um, that there's nothing whatsoever in the 2013 uh, initial resolution that says um, what specific projects it would be spent on. Instead, there was a separate memo at the time provided by finance to the council that said $18 million of that money would be used for bridges. Um, there were separate um, verbal representations of the council that by bridges, what was meant was the pedestrian bridge in the gulch. Um, and what we're collectively doing on these two bills is taking that $18 million of the 2013 initial resolution and um, authorizing different projects than the ones um, that were in the separate side memo and the separate verbal communications that we were given at the time. There's a, um, uh, a strong argument that it could be only one million of the new allocation that we actually need to approve, and the administration is nonetheless coming to us um, for the resolution to um, consent to the other $17 million of, of reality. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. That answers most of it. But so in terms of when we actually buy commercial paper or issue bonds, that timing is, is pretty separate from this Completely. statement of what it's being spent on. Completely okay, separate. The, as I understand it, the commercial paper versus bonds is really just a function of when um, the, the bond market is deemed favorable. One last question. And when we actually do issue bonds, that also comes before us and we okay a specific bond issue. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Let's see, Councilmember Benedict. Thank you, Chair. 
So I'm curious about the math here. Uh, one bill has 16.95 million, one has 1 million, so we're at 17.95, but it's 18 million, so where's the extra 50 grand? I think it's really just 17.95. Yeah, the 18 was just for rounding purposes, but it's the actual amount is 17.95. Hold on one second, please, while I pull up the bill. Um, it looks like it's referenced as 18 million in resolution 2019-116. Yeah, and that would be an amount not to exceed would be the language in the resolution. Well, and in the, if you're looking at resolution 116, the actual resolution part, um, section three, uses the specific number, 16.95. Correct, so. And, and the exhibit A, which is incorporated into resolution 116, has the, the specific amounts also. Thank you. Councilmember Glover. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Cooper, uh, so you saw me kind of drop my pen when we, uh, or when it was referenced that in 2013, we didn't actually appropriate the money for that bridge. It was kind of put in a, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chair, it was sort of put out there, uh, but it wasn't specifically for that. I voted specifically against that bridge and it was my understanding at the time, and I obviously haven't pulled it up to reread that, I thought the money was allocated specifically for a gulch bridge. It was the mayor's intent that that money be used for the gulch pedestrian bridge. Gulch pedestrian bridge is not, those words are not within the resolution anywhere. You just have a, a broad list of eligible categories of projects. Okay, so as we go forward, and this is the reason I'm asking the question, Chair, as we go forward with some of the uh, uh, transparency issues, uh, some of the legislation and, and the, the bills that we're looking forward into, uh, when we pass those, we would specifically have to name projects with dollar amounts given them as we go forward, is that, that correct? That's the current operating procedure, yes. Okay, well I'm asking the question for a very real reason, because boy, it sure was made clear at that point, that's what the money was gonna be used for, and uh, as we found out, there's been a lot of things we were told that weren't necessarily completely true. Since 2017, I believe, the initial bond resolutions have included language incorporating the project list into right. the resolution with those specific amounts. In 2013, that was not the case. Okay, and, and that's why, again, I'm asking because it was it sure, uh, yeah. what I could remember of it, that was exactly the way I remembered it. All right, thank you, Chair. Well, and Mr. Glover, just to um, clarify for viewers, so in the last term, we did three capital spending plans. In the first two, there were amendments from uh, Mr. Cooper and, Ms. and, and me um, to make it that uh, there would be an itemized list attached. And uh, in legislation that we have pending now, um, we would make it so um, specific uh, projects were tied to the amounts in addition to categories. So this is something where um, very shortly we'll, we'll have uh, licked um, this issue. Um, Council Member Swara. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there was an email that was sent that detailed the projects uh, that this part of the uh, resolution is dealing with. And my question uh, on that is that there is a f about $4 million that was not specified. It just says emergency spending. There's a 1.7, a 1.7, a 400, and so if we're looking at specific projects, uh, what does that 4 million cover right now? And if we don't need it right now, do we need to approve that 4 million? And I think I sent an email to somebody in the council office. I sent it to Mike. One, one second. 
down here where you've got the emergency projects. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, um, I guess w we should have somebody talk about that. It's my, my understanding that these are things that need work done right now that are smaller dollar amounts, but I don't know if there's somebody in the administration Which that can works. talk about that, or Public Works that can talk about that. Council members, I'm Sharon Wallstrom with Department of Public Works. Right now, we have no money left in the bridges and culverts that is not already appropriated to specific projects. So if we have an emergency, like this last year, we had a culvert collapse and it caused a landslide, we would have no money to be able to go back and repair those kind of items. So we put emergency money in here, hoping that we never have to spend it. But if we do, we have the money to go back and repair those kind of items. If a culvert collapses in a road or something else, this, this gives us some money to be able to go back and repair those things that are not foreseeable. Yes, council member. That is the $4 million. Pardon? That sums up to $4 million. Um, it's, it's got several different categories. If you see some of the bridge has the 480, the culverts total up to about, what, the two 1.7s. We also have responsibility for guardrails. And then we had 410 in um, emergency roadway works for other items that might happen. Any further questions? Council Member Vircher. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't, I don't want to belabor the point as it relates to the bridge, but I do know it was a, a grand affair. We did the tours and the design and, and media was there and so forth. Can we get an amount as to what was paid for, for design, if anyone, if anyone has that? I know I've asked for that uh, previously, and it wasn't very much. Um, I don't know whether finance has that handy. Go ahead. I don't have that number handy. I, I have it somewhere. Um, but if memory serves, only about 50000 had been spent out of the original amount allocated for design. It was somewhere in the forty-five dollars to $50,000 range. Uh, if memory serves, but I can get that exact figure for you, Council Lady. Any further discussion about this? All right, we've got a, um, seeing none, we've got motion to approve resolution 2019-100 and resolution 2019-116 that have been moved and properly seconded. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, we recommend approval. Next is resolution RS 2019-117, Amendus Heard and others approves a contract between Prevent Child Abuse Tennessee and the Metro Board of Health to provide funding to employ a program coordinator for the Collective Impact Initiative. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? We recommend approval. RS 2019-119 authorizes Metro Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Tracy Harding and Clinton Harding against Metro government in the amount of $137. It's been moved and seconded and seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? We recommend approval. RS 2019-120, Amendez Pulley Hancock approves a grant from the Tennessee Department of Safety and Homeland Security to the Metro Nashville Police Department for enhanced DUI enforcement of Tennessee driving under the influence laws. It's been moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? We recommend approval. RS 2019-121, Mendez, Henderson, and others approves an application for a flood mitigation assistance grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Department of Water and Sewage Services Department. The Department of Water and Sewage Services Department. Is there a motion? Move. Mr. Glover? Just uh, out of curiosity, can, since I know water's here, can, can they kind of explain to us what exactly this accomplishes? I mean, I realize 
that it's a grant, but I, I would still kind of like to understand exactly uh, what it does, please. Thank sure. You. Looks like we've got somebody from the department coming to the podium now. I'm uh, Tom Palco, Metro Water Services, Stormwater Division. Uh, these these are home buyout grants, so it's a voluntary program where if the property that has previous flood losses, if they want to participate, we will buy it out at fair market value. So uh, just out of curiosity, I mean, is this, a, it, I don't think this is any carryover from 2010 still. Is this new properties that have been identified? Mr. Palco? Yes, the, uh, all the projects from 2010 have been closed out, and so That's this is right. a new opportunity for another application for additional funds from uh, a previous disaster somewhere else in Tennessee. Money's available. We have an opportunity to go try to capture some of those funds. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Seeing no further discussion, it's been moved and properly seconded. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? We recommend approval. RS 2019-122, Mendez, Henderson, and others approves an application for a flood mitigation assistance grant from the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Department of Metro Water and Sewage Services. Is there a motion? Moved. It's been moved and seconded. Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? We recommend approval. Um, uh, on to bills for the second reading, BL 2019-46, Mendez, Syracuse, and others amends the Metro Code to require the Department of Water and Sewage Services to submit annual reports to the Metro Council. Moved. And then there's um, a substitute. If somebody would like to move that, then we'll ask Mr. Cooper to explain what's in the substitute. All right, um, Mr. Cooper. In addition to the annual report, the substitute would require semi-annual reports for the next two years um, that would detail or, or provide a summary of the implementation of the water and sewer rate increase, um, just so you would get those every six months for the first two years of the implementation of the rate increase. Mr. Glover. And let me just make sure I understand here. It, that'll be in written form. That will not be a formal presentation in correct. front of the council, correct? Correct. That would be a written report, and then um, the director of Metro Water Services under the original bill will appear once a year. Okay. So even under the substitute, the, the original intent to come in and talk to the council yes. once a year in person. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the substitute's been moved and seconded, not seeing any other discussion. All in favor of the substitute say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Move bill is substituted. The bill as substituted has been moved and seconded, seeing no further discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We recommend approving with the, the bill as substituted for approval. BL 2019-75 Rosenberg Tombs amends the Metro Code to require 911 telecommunicators to be trained in the delivery of high quality telecommunicator cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Um, and I, I think I've got a letter from the lead sponsor asking for a one meeting deferral. Do you want to make that motion, Council Member Tombs? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Move for a one meeting deferral. Second. Is there any discussion on the one meeting deferral? All right. Uh, the one meeting deferral has been moved and properly seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We recommend a one meeting deferral. Uh, BL 2019 77, Mendez, Welsh, and others amends the Metro Code to require full disclosure of full cost itemization prior to submission of capital expenditure authorization legislation to the Metro Council. Move. Um, and this is, uh, um, I'll, I'll call Mr. Glover, go ahead. Well, actually, Chair, go ahead and, and with you, you may answer the question I was going to ask. Um, this is what we referred to earlier about the pending legislation that would make um, uh, full details, including tying um, capital spending to specific projects, um, be part of the Metro Code. Okay. Now, Mr. Cooper, I'm going to take it one step further. We typically will get into projects, and inevitably it costs more money than is given to us. What type of warning mechanisms do we have inside of this that would uh, allow us to see that in advance as opposed to saying, oh, well, we need to give another X million 
in order to finish a project. Does that help identify any of, of that aspect in this particular bill? I think the, the thought behind the bill is that departments, when they submit the request, will take that into consideration when they submit it to the finance department and the mayor. Um, the, the bill does allow for uh, market-based cost increases. So if the, the cost of steel goes way up or labor costs go way up, then that, that can be adjusted. Um, but the, the idea is to, to do full cost-based approval at the time instead of 35 million, maybe we can get it done, maybe not. Okay, so if we have uh, an additional cost, because, and I'll use the example of steel, it goes up by 5%, 10%, then you would be, we, we would be able to see that where it would correlate back to the, uh, the project cost as far as why there may be, quote, overruns on it, as opposed to the example you just gave, uh, we think we can do it for 35 and we're going to land where we land. Is that the way I'm understanding it? Yes. The, I mean, within each spending plan, you will have some amount for contingencies. Okay. And so, right. So as long as, as they don't exceed the, the project cost plus whatever available contingency, then, then that would be fine. If, if they did go over that, they would have to come back and, and seek further authorization for more capital funds. Okay. okay. All right. I, I think the way I'm, I'm looking at that is... Um, there, there does have to be some allowance for contingency, yeah. um, and and so there's uh, um, w w what this would prevent is where you could have lots of projects simultaneously that were just lowballed um, with placeholder numbers. Um, you know, if there's one project that's going to be um, over, two projects that are going to be over, but the amount over fits within the contingency, then it's going to be okay. So it's going to be incumbent upon us to make sure that we don't allow a contingency that swallows everything up. Um, and um, I think the, the main thing we're trying to avoid is that there's not wholesale lots of projects simultaneously where there's just made up plug numbers. Well, I, so I'll use a specific example. Uh, and it certainly is no, no fault uh, of the sheriff, but what's occurring over on the building that's happening there, obviously there's discrepancy on uh, money versus what cost is going to be, et cetera. Does this step in, because I was trying to read it to make sure I understood, does this step in to help avoid that kind of pitfall? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can, can I just get a reality check from maybe public works and schools on at, at the time when we're doing, I'm, I'm presuming this is at the capital spending plan stage is when we're asking for this. And um, if that's typically the point in a process when they have enough detail to be able to get a number close enough to fit what we're, we're asking for. I'll just say as an engineer, I hate doing estimates and I'm, I'm never anywhere near where I ought to be. So can, can we just get some... I would note that the, the ordinance excludes capital funds for planning purposes. So like if you had one project that was a feasibility study or to find out whether you could build a project here and what the cost would be, that wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to know that the detail at that point. Um, but gotcha. you would when you're ready to actually fund the project. Gotcha. Um, Sure, we can invite them up. I, w I would make the point as we're thinking about this, though, that uh, um, we got to err one way or the other. We've, we're in the middle of seeing what it's like to not have a rule like this, and um, project after project apparently has a made-up number in it, like literally made-up number. And so we either get to tolerate that or we get to run the risk of having to have more um, planning investments before we get the full number. But I, yeah. I see a few folks lined yeah, up if we to could, talk about thanks. it. Thanks. I mean, just in terms of, of where those projects typically are in the in the process, if the level of detail we've asked for is 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 doable and appropriate. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Mark Sturdivant, Public Works. Um, the quality of our estimates, the accuracy, is going to depend on how much time we have to do it, how many, and the resources that we have to do it. We're often 
particularly when the capital budget is due, we're often put in a position where we have to work pretty fast. We don't want to go over budget. I mean, we, you know, we're trying to do the best we can, but our accuracy is going to depend on those things. The more complex the project, if there's land involved or right away, that's, that's just going to take more time uh, for us to, you know, be as accurate as we can, so. Timing is, is an issue. Um, uh, the school board usually approves the, the capital budget in January, uh, and uh, it is our construction uh, uh, projects are itemized like, like this ordinance would require. Uh, that's not that big a problem. But things change between, uh, between then and the time a capital spending plan actually occurs. So that, uh, that may be an issue. Is that, does that address your, your question? Any more questions, Councilmember Allen? No, thank you. All right. Councilmember Suara. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, uh, that's where I was going because the comments on the uh, analysis did say there's uh, exclusion for preliminary project planning and enterprise funds. And I guess my thought is if we're trying to, I think this came out wanting to have an idea of what's going on. So why are we excluding those and why are we excluding preliminary projects if it meets the threshold? Go ahead. I think excluding the enterprise fund is, is I mean, that was just because it's water sewer ratepayer money that's going to fund that. And the, the way that they do debt and capital projects is different than, than the rest of the government. I think for the f feasibility costs, um, you know, and, and preliminary planning study, it was just to ensure that um, you wouldn't have to have an estimate for the full project when you're not even sure you're going to be able to do the project. I guess uh, if we have a threshold of five million dollars, right, that's what we're going with. Shouldn't it be anything that meets that threshold to be able to have an, uh, something? That's what we're asking for. I, I just don't understand why we're excluding it. If it meets that five million threshold and we're saying anything that meets that threshold, we want an itemization. Even if it's an estimate, I still think that it should be included. What, so let's talk about the enterprise funds first. The, the enterprise, I'm okay. I can, I'm okay with. All right. Uh, um, um, so the enterprise, I can, I can, I can see because they, they basically control. They bring in the money. They spend the money, <laughs> within reasons. Uh, but the preliminary one, I still don't understand. So, like, if there was a preliminary planning. That is item that million. was more than five million. Yeah. Um, wh wh where's the exclusion for the planning? Uh, do, you, do you have the legislation? One, one second. So you're looking at, I don't know if you have it in front of you, the, the exclusion in D1 about these requirements don't apply to capital projects that are limited solely to preliminary project planning or feasibility? I, um, I guess, well, I don't know, I'll just, I'll speak for myself. Um, all these things that are listed, land acquisition, environmental compliance, temporary location, if there was a planning project that cost more than $5 million, they, they still wouldn't know, like, the land cost. Like, one, one of the planning things we did, we, we approved in a capital spending plan $10 million for planning for the flood wall or downtown flood protection system, whichever you prefer. Um, uh, and if... On, on that 10 million for the the flood wall they wouldn't have been it would I don't know how they would have included land acquisition environmental compliance temporary relocation architectural engineering and design construction etc because it still would have been in the in the planning phase that point is just the ballpark estimate. 
if it's just this is for clarification for my side. Well, nice. if so. it's if it's planning, I think in feasibility, it's the whole point of the spending is to figure out whether the project is doable in the first place. And the planning phase will cost us five million in itself. If it's a as as I understand it, project. if it's a big enough project, the planning could cost more than that. Anybody else have questions about this? Comments? All right. Um, BL 2019-77 has been moved and seconded and seeing no further discussion. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. We recommend approval. Next is BL 2019-80, Hauser, Mendez, and others, grants two permanent easements to the Harpeth Valley Utility District of Davidson and Williamson Counties for property owned by Metro Government. Sir? Um, I don't see anybody with their button pressed, but one thing I wanted to ask finance is this does have a fiscal note, a small one, admittedly, um, of $7,150. Um, I'm assuming that's in the operating budget. Yes. Well, I mean, we're actually it'll draining the easements to Harpeth Valley and the value of those easements theoretically would be $7,100. All so right, it's not yeah, like there's no it's money it, 7150 is the appraised amount. All right, Ms. Mr. Cooper, Mr. McGuire pointing out I've asked a ridiculous question, so <laughs> <laughs> I take it back. For the record, I did not say that. <laughs> you said it very nicely. Um, Mr. Glover. Well, I'll go ahead and add to the ridiculous questions then. <laughs> Um, all right, so tell me exactly how this works in unison because trying to, to read and understand the easement here, and, and I always get confused when we talk about, uh, you know, a separate utility company and how this works, et cetera, on the easements. Um, can, can somebody just help me understand who, who is actually – Who's responsible for, for what we're doing here? Is it going to be Harpeth? Is it going to be Metro? Is it who, who exactly is it going to be? Someone may be better able to speak from Metro Water, but in, in this case, this would be property that is served by Harpeth Valley Utility Districts. We have utility easements currently. Harpeth Valley Utility District is going to put in the sewer line, so we are dedicating the easement to them for that purpose, and then they would own and maintain the line. Okay. I so, think that's right. And we've got Mr. Potter. That's okay. correct. Thank you. So he says that's correct. Okay. All right. So, all right. So then hypothetically, let me just ask this question, if I may. Hypothetically, there's a problem down the road. Uh, it will be exclusively the Harpeth, and in Correct. this case, Harpeth, is responsible for everything else. All we're doing is just saying, yeah, you get to use the land that we already had the easement on. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember Sora, did you have anything on this one? All right. All right. Uh, BL 2019-80 has been properly moved and seconded. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We recommend approval. Um, now, bills on third reading. This is our last item on our agenda. BL 2019-45, Mendes, Mendez, Henderson, and others amends various sections of the Metro Code. This is the um, water rate bill. And there's a, uh, well, I'm pretty sure, is there a motion? So, and we'll go to Mr. Glover next. Okay, so I have an amendment that I want to add to this, and, and uh, Mr. Cooper, I don't know if this is Amendment A, B, C, D, I'm not sure, but... Um, the one that's on the desk. Yes, the one that's on the desk. And Well, so I, let, let, let me actually, uh, so in the amendments package, there's an Amendment 1 and 2, and as I understand it, you're not going to move those, and there's a separate one um, that's been placed on the desk that you do want to talk about. Well, so here, here's what I'm going to ask. Because do, do I need to move one and two and then come and talk about this? Or do we go ahead and talk about the I'll one that's... i just talk about the uh, third one. And okay. I can explain the need for or why you're doing that unless you want to. No, no, no. I, I would I'd feel much more comfortable if you would do it. 
All right, so then chair, I'm gonna move my amendment uh, and then it will require, and I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Cooper after this, I believe it requires a suspension of the rules for tomorrow night tomorrow because night. of the way, the circumstances of how this occurred. So with that, if I could chair, I would ask Mr. Cooper to explain it to us and uh, we'll go forward. Well, let, let's get a second. So oh, you, you, Mr. Glover is moving the one that's a single sheet of paper um, on our desk that has amendment number blank. And so is there a second for that so we can talk about it? All right, there's been a second. Mr. Cooper. Councilman Glover had an amendment in the amendments packet for the last meeting that he did not offer that would have um, imposed an additional 5% surcharge that would be used for two purposes. Um, up to $50 million would be used in an emergency fund for unforeseen capital projects that, that happen. Um, over and above that, it would be used essentially to pay down debt. Uh, we learned this morning through a conversation with Metro's bond council that that would be inconsistent with the bond covenants that take effect in January of 2020, um, which basically say that all revenue of the system is pledged towards the debt and then there's a waterfall for how those funds flow. And so what this amendment does in order to be consistent with the bond covenants is to say that this additional 5% surcharge would flow through the waterfall as required by the bond covenants, but it's the intention that this be surplus money, which would then be used to pay down debt either through uh, retiring commercial paper or just cash funding capital projects. And then Mr. Cooper, if you would, let's talk about when uh, this would uh, end and and the purpose for that ending. So there's a two year sunset date built into the amendment and the council would have to extend the surcharge by resolution or it would automatically end um, and then the, f the funds would just stay in the surplus fund if it if it ended anything that was left over okay and so chair if you would indulge me for just a second and let me kind of walk you through on because we've had a number of conversations here on the floor and i know you've communicated through mr cooper has of others and myself back and forth trying to you know come up with something that could be feasible uh, first of all I, I never ever want to take money out of anybody's pocket unless i think there's a very good reason and i think we'd have to be able to justify it in order to do so. In the conversations I've had, the one part that has always bothered me is there is not a crystal ball to determine do we, do we have another May 2010 within the first year or so. And while we can talk about that it may be sufficient with the way uh, and, and, and the rate of increase that we're gonna approve, I haven't been able to reach mathematically that there looks like there'd be enough money out there for a, an emergency situation of that magnitude. So that was the purpose of adding this to say, all right, look, I, I don't want to take any more money out of people's pocket than is necessary. However, for the first little bit, for the first year or two or so here, yeah, we'll play it and we'll use it. And the original intent, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Mr. Cooper, the original intent was it would, it would be exclusively for those projects, but, um, or pay down the debt, or, and, and it basically would have to sit, uh, and, and you know, we had, we'd looked at some various language on that. However, based on the conversations you had this morning, Mr. Cooper, the bond covenants and that take effect, did you say January 2nd? January 2nd, 2nd. is what Jeff Oldham said. Okay, so because of what will take effect, and this really is gonna be happening in unison, that's why that we have drafted the new language uh, to where it fits within and we're not violating those covenants. Did I do it okay? Correct. Okay, all right, so with that, I'll renew my motion to uh, uh, on the amendment, please, sir. All right, we've got a couple people in the queue. Um, Council Member Druffel. Yeah, I like the idea overall. Uh, question, is there an ROI by paying this debt service off early? Um, or are we just trying to be prudent? 
Well, I, th I think under this new version, we don't know that it'll go to debt service. Okay. So um, how do we know it'll be applied? I mean, I, I guess I'd like a little bit more detail. Mr. Cooper. Well, assuming that you've you've met all of the required operating expenses um, that, that Metro um, Metro Water has paid all the required operating expenses and debt service and has the the required coverage ratios. Um, assuming all that happens, this would be extra money that they otherwise wouldn't have, and so it would just it would go into the surplus revenue fund, which would then be used either to cash fund projects or to retire commercial paper. Is there, I guess there is a timeline on how much would sit there for how long? I, well, I think the, the initial estimate, and Metro Water can probably better speak to this, but I think the initial estimate was that an additional 5% surcharge would basically delay the need to issue debt by one year. So you're you're putting off the, the need to issue debt because you're have this additional money that you could pay for capital projects. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Suara. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I like the idea of having money for rainy days and things like that, but I, I really don't think this is the time for it. And I said that because the, the new rates that we're proposing, my understanding, and the reason why I kept asking that question, is that it really does include a component for infrastructure. And so people are already being taxed to pay for that on the new rate. And so for us to tag on another 5%, I think it's just, it's just too much at this point. Thank you. Councilmember Toombs. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with Councilwoman Suara. Um, I have constituents who have reached out to me um, who are concerned about the rate increase that's already coming. And so to add additional um, fees on top of that, I, I don't agree that that's a good idea. All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, Councilmember Vercher. Thank you, Chair. Just want to hear if uh, Metro Water has a position on it and, and how would they allocate uh, the, the additional, um, if, it, if it were to pass on, the, on this amendment. Um, the, the reason why I want the department's perspective is because um, we've had a stormwater rate increase for the last two years and we still get the same complaints that, that many issues aren't being addressed as it relates to the rate that already went into effect. So if we're going to raise the rate, we need to make sure that um, we that the community is really getting the, the benefit from the rate itself. No one in here wants to raise rates. No one in here wants to raise um, taxes, uh, particularly in, in this city where we know wages are stagnant and affordability um, is continuing to, to increase. So if we're going to raise it, we need to make sure that we're getting uh, what we need to do the work to service the people in the city. We don't need to come back again um, some years later um, and, and departments say they can't uh, tackle various projects because they still don't have the revenue. So I don't want us to keep going through this saying, the same song and dance as it relates to raising, raising these fees. Just want to make sure that is the rate right um, to, to service the city and the, the accelerated growth that we have and all the issues that we have. Um, I'll, just, I'll just leave it with that, Chair. All right. Hi there, Amanda Deaton Moyer with Metro Water Services. Um, the rates as proposed are sufficient to meet our forecasted capital and operating needs. Um, the amendment um, under consideration today, it would bolster our resources um, in any emergent situation, and it would reduce the frequency of which we go to the bond market um, for debt needs. But today we do believe it, it absolutely covers our capital and our operating needs. So this amendment um, really actually boosts um, the proposed rate. Yes, ma'am. So why wasn't this already part of the consideration anyway? Um, I mean, it, it just it just speaks to my question. Here we are, we raising the rates. Councilman Glover is coming with an amendment. Um, I, 
guess I'm having difficulty understanding is, is the rate accurate to get us where we're trying to get to, encompassing everything. We can't keep piecemealing these rates to, to, to get us by. Two years ago, we raised stormwater rates, and we still have issues with projects as it relates to, to neighborhoods being serviced. We can't do this, um, this same song and dance if we're going to increase the, the water rates and sewer rates. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Council Member Glover. So let me try and address, if I may, Chair, some of the questions that, that have been brought up and, and frankly, are, are, are actual and, and great concerns. In doing the math, and if I could, Chair, I would like for Metro Water to come back up. If we have another event this coming May, like we had in May of 2010, is this sufficient to cover uh, those emergency types of situations uh, in the first year, the first six months, the first whatever? And I'm not saying that, that my particular amendment would. However, mathematically, I couldn't come up with an equation that looked right within the first roughly 12 to 24 months if we had another big hit. And I certainly hope we don't. I would just rather be prepared and then second, if I may add, you know, one of the reasons Tennessee does such a great job financially is because on the road projects, it's pr primarily paid for by cash. You know, we, we collect the money, we pay it for cash, and so therefore we're not sticking interest on top of bonds and charges and everything else. So we're not having to pay for the road multiple times. Um, that was another part of the thought process in this. Um, and then my final thought, and this really is just my final thought, is, you know, death by a thousand cuts is a rough, rough way to go. While none of us want to raise rates, apparently we're in a position we have no choice. I mean, I think we heard that when the controller was here. So I was trying to just merely forecast out, and if we don't do it, we don't do it. But if we do, I merely think it will, I, I, or excuse me, I think it may put us in a in a better position in the event we have a uh, a large emergency. If we don't, that's why the sun sits there for it to go away, uh, unless this council wants to renew it. Thank you for your indulgence, Chair. All right, no problem. And Mr. Potter, can you address the um, first question about um, what uh, the department would do if there was a May 2010 event, um, either with or without this extra surcharge? I, I agree with the councilman completely about putting us in a better position to respond because if you have the if you have the additional funds sitting in that in that uh, so-called emergency fund, it, it, it provides for um, cash immediately. Once we go to the two-year sunset provision, we have that money available and it will allow us to cash fund projects instead of having to bond fund the projects. So overall, it's a great idea. Um, I understand the concerns about taking more money out of people's pockets, but I think if we use the word prudent, I think that applies here. Um, I support it. It's, um, it's, an it's an additional charge to our customers, but I think if we go from a position of prudence, I think it's a good idea. Well, let me, before I turn it back over to Mr. Glover if he has follow-up. Um, is uh, the water rate, are the water rates as uh, proposed in the original bill prudent also? Yes, or? sir. So either, either way is prudent? Yes. All right. Mr. Glover, do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, and I'm going to ask Mr. Cooper just to kind of clarify this because uh, obviously this was new on the language this morning after you had the conversation with the Bond Council. This really boils down more to a kind of a pinky shake of the, the water is uh, water's going to utilize the money the way the original intent was but because we passed where they've got to come back in once a year for a comprehensive report to us and then also once a year with a written report to us this kind of lets us see that to find out if we've been as transparent as we had hoped we would be with this rate increase okay. It, additionally, with the, the substitute that the committee recommended, there's the additional semi-annual report about implementation of the water rate increase, which would <coughs> include this. So you're, you're going to know what was collected and what was spent. Right. 
And, and, and Chair, let me, let me say this. I, I think this, I've always understood it to be, uh, you know, sufficient with the rate increase that the Water uh, Department gave to the state as far as how they feel like we'll, we'll come back out of where we are right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you didn't live through 2010 on this floor or in my, in my situation on the floor at the school board when it occurred and all the, the money that just started rushing out the door, that was, I mean, that was the motivator for me quite frankly, because I could not make the numbers work that if we have another devastating event like that uh, in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, it, it just concerned me greatly. Once again, for the reason for to sunset it, because if we don't need it, that's okay. It will end up being used, and maybe for the first time in a long time, people will actually get a reduction in their water rates if, if it's not necessary to continue with the plan because at that point there's no doubt in my mind at the 24 month 36 month marker that you have sufficient funds coming in to accommodate everything thank you uh, thank you mr glover we we've got uh, another round of uh, five people in the queue and I, i'll just uh, i haven't really commented on this yet the only the only thing that I, I appreciate where it's coming from and i'm i'm genuinely torn between the logic that you just stated versus the, I, I just, I get nervous about um, every penny that gets added to water rates is a penny that somehow we don't add to property tax and um, and that we shortchange that. And, uh, um, but I'm, I got now six people in the queue, so I'm gonna uh, just leave it at that and start heading through everybody. Council Member Toombs. Thank you, Chair. So, so that I understand what's, what's happening. So the Water Department is saying that the current rate as proposed is enough, but the extra fee would bolster their position. But I'm hearing from Councilman Glover that he doesn't believe, actually, that the current rate as proposed is enough and that they need additional funds. Am I understanding that right? Mr. Glover, let me just toss it back to you. To no, what, what I stated was, and, and please make sure that I, I'll try to be very clear. What I stated was that if we had another 2010 event, a May 2010 event within the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months, I'm not certain based on the math and, and looking at the history that it's sufficient with, with, with what's approved. If we don't have an event like that, and, and I'm certain none of us want that to occur again, if that doesn't happen, then that's the reason for the sunset. So that that's all, all I'm trying to do is think ahead. And uh, again, if we don't use it, it moves us to more of a cash position where we're not having to borrow the money and pay additional interest on something that's going to cost what it costs today regardless. And then we have to pay interest on top of that. Thank you. Anything else, Council Member Timms? So... Does the water department agree that if something were to happen in the next six to 12 to 18 months, there wouldn't be sufficient funds to handle it? That's really a difficult question to answer from a yes or no perspective, because you have to look at it from a position of risk. We're an extraordinarily risk averse organization. So if we had an additional emergency fund available to us, it would put us in a less risky position, which is a very good thing. Other than that, I really can't get specific about what might happen in the next six months, 12 months. Fundamentally, we would respond as we always have. This puts in a position, puts us in a better position, in my opinion, to have that cash available in case it does happen. So it's purely a risk discussion. Um, it's really not an either or. It's a, it's a question of how much risk can we mitigate by having this additional money. Plus, the two years later, if we, if we have the cash funded and we sunset it, then it's a good thing to have that cash available to cash fund projects instead of a, assuming additional debt. So to me, I really can't go yes, no on this. I have to go from a risk perspective and always advocate our position that we want to mitigate risk to the degree we can. 
So I would ask that same question, if I may, Council Member Toombs. Um, if the council were to approve the rates as originally proposed, is the city taking any inappropriate risk from your perspective? No, sir. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, anything else? All right, uh, Mr. Druffles next. Uh, the, the question is, um, we're really playing defense. It, how long would it take to finance that emergency amount of money that may be needed, um, assuming we understand that from a 2010 type event? Um, I'm, I'm going to let Mr. Potter answer this one, but my view would be um, without knowing the event and the actual dollar amount, um, I'll in the, at the end of the day, um, he just told us that the rates as originally proposed did not create any inappropriate risk for the city. So, and, and he told us that um, the, they'd be able to do what they need to do. Um, the extra money um, uh, makes it easier. But Mr. Potter can answer. I think that's a good summary. It goes back to my discussion about risk and um, how much we want to assume. But, but assume that you didn't have enough. How long would it take for us to get an estimate and then approve the amount of money you need, and let's say it's an extreme event? So, well, you go back to we would respond accordingly. And I think the rates are sufficient to, to do that. But this comes back to the position of is it a better idea or not to have the additional money available in case something does happen? And I'm always going to be in the position that that is a good thing. So what I'm not going to do is stand here and say that I think not accepting a reduction in risk is a good thing. This puts us in a better position um, from a risk perspective. And I really, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going in a circle because I'm saying the same thing over and over. The summary is I don't like risk. And this mitigates it. So that's kind of my, my summary. Yeah, I, I think my point is, is if we can get enough money approved quick enough through this body, if, if it was an extreme situation, it would re reduce the risk also. In that well, way. but there's no mechanism to do that. Um, we can't go to our customer base and for a month increase the rates to cover a capital expenditure of $75 million. So. I'll go back to worst case on 2010. So we lost the KRH plant for 30 days. We were, we were within inches of losing Omohundro. So if we had lost both plants for 30 days, the city would, would have been without water. So at that point, I had a conversation with the mayor on the Tuesday that I advocated that we start planning on bringing in train loads of water. That's how close we got. So. Living that once was enough for me. If I have cash sitting available to do emergency work, I'm going to jump up and down and say, that's a great thing. Yeah. And while, while you're there, just to follow up, Mr. Yeah. When you're, when you're figuring out the proposed water rate, you guys, um, I assume, uh, did all this calculus to figure out how much was an adequate surcharge to cover uh, uh, an acceptable level of risk? Well, when we did this rate study, the councilman's proposal wasn't part of our discussion. So this is in addition to the rate study. I happen to think it's a good idea, but we didn't build in a 5% surcharge because we had a 10% surcharge for infrastructure renewal on the water and the sewer side. So this is clearly an addition to what we proposed. It's just a question about whether or not it's a good idea or not. And I'm advocating that it's a good idea because it will provide additional cash. I get your point, Chair. I really do. But I can't stand here and tell you that I don't think it's a good idea to build up a reserve fund. I, I know we, we had a um, not that happy exchange last time, but I, I, you should also, you're also being clear that you guys had an opportunity to work on uh, proposed new rates for literally years, and you came up with an acceptable r level of risk um, the f in, in what's actually proposed, right? Entirely accurate. Right. So now we're talking about whether we want to... Um, uh, 
cover an additional increment of risk on a super low probability event above what you guys advocated and what the state's approved and is ordering? You don't need a fire extinguisher until it's on fire. <laughs> well, hell, why don't we just make it 20% then? That'll eliminate all your risk, right? No. <laughs> 30% take care of all the risk? Would it? Is that a real question? Yeah. No, sir, it wouldn't. Okay, so 50% would take care of all the risk? You never mitigate risk in our business completely. Uh, okay, so we're just picking an acceptable level of risk. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Druffel, do you have any more questions for him? Um, Council Member Suara. Oh, thank you, Chair. I think most of what I had in mind you've already asked, but what I just wanted to say was that uh, when the rate was presented to us, my understanding was that there was a company, a consulting company that came in and did all the calculation and gave this rate, and I remember that Councilman Glover actually asking uh, if this is all that we need to charge the people and no more, and the answer was yes at the time. And so to now, we now put that rate forward. We start telling people what it is, people started having meetings and sharing that rate, and now we want to come back and say, no, we're wrong, that's not the right rate. If we're talking about trust in government, we cannot keep doing this. And I think that to tag on now, to now say that what we did and what we espouse as being the correct one, that was well calculated and is the right thing, to now come back and say maybe or not or something, I just think it's not, it's not right. Thank you. Councilmember Porterfield. Uh, thank you so much, Chair. You actually hit uh, the majority of the, the points and questions that I had. Um, I did want some clarification um, from uh, Mr. Potter, if I could. He said 10% was built in. So is this 5% on top of the 10% that's already built in? Um, which is my first question. And, and I'm also torn on this. I, I see the value in having savings. Um, but I also think if this was necessary, it would have built, been built into the um, original rate. Um, my second question is, what is the, the dollar amount? We're talking about an additional 5% surcharge. What does that actually look like on bills uh, for customers? On the actual bill, it can be, depending on the usage, between 50 cents and up to $2 for a residential, uh, residential customer. What would it be for commercial? That's really hard to gauge because a lot of commercial customers will have three to five meters and have different types of meters and so forth, so we'd have to look at that on an on a individual basis. Thank you. And one more question, Chair, if you would indulge. Um, is there any provision set for uh, senior citizens, uh, low-income families, or anyone who can't afford the additional increase. Mr. Cooper will take that question. So by law, we cannot have any kind of rate differential based on any specific class or, or type of user. So it, 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 we have to, by law, we have to treat everyone the same from a rate standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Glover, you're next, but if you want, I can save you to the end either way. Uh, wait till the end. All right, Council Member Allen. Thank you. This may be redundant with what we've already said. Mr. Potter, one more time. If you could just clarify, the, the consultant who did the study was making his assumptions based on best practices, I'm presuming. I mean, he, look, he looked at what does it cost to build all the pipes and, and have all the people, and, and I mean, that was, that was all done according to standards that are accepted across the industry. <clears throat> That's correct. The American Water Works Association has a manual, it's called the M1, that dictates in great clarity how you build rates. So our rate consultant, Raftelis, who are experts in this field, followed that methodology exactly. So what we have here is we went through that methodology and we came up with a rate that we think is accurate. So the councilman proposed this amendment. I have, there's no way on earth I can't support that because it mitigates risk for us. Gotcha. And so what it's looking at is something you don't typically look at, which is what happens if there's an extraordinary event, which is just, again, a risk management question. It's always about risk. Gotcha. And how much risk we want to mitigate. To me, this is a good thing because it mitigates risk. If it doesn't mitigate risk, it's a bad thing. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Council Member Vircher. <laughs> 
Thank you. That's why I was going to go with my question uh, with uh, Councilwoman Allen was the, the, the actual study and the methodology wasn't necessarily um, focusing on um, uh, reserve funds in the event of, of something catastrophic. Being out in Southeast, it doesn't take a catastrophic event uh, for us to get flooding out there at, at, at Mill Creek. Um, so, Councilman Glover, I, I like the idea. I haven't heard it uh, being articulated as to uh, the proposed, um, I believe, 10 percent, if that's including how much of that uh, would be actually going towards um, reserves in the event of something catastrophic or, or it may not even be going towards it um, at all. So um, I, I, I'm going to support this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Porterfield. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I realized I didn't get an answer for the first question that I had. The 10 percent that was uh, built in is the 5 percent on top of the 10 percent. Yes, and then the, uh, the other question is uh, similar to what Council Lady Bircher just asked. In that 10 percent, how much of that um, is set aside, I guess, for a catastrophic 1,000-year flood that we just experienced in 2010? Mr. Cooper got, has that one. Well, it is on top of the 10 percent, um, so that, that is a separate surcharge that is designed to replace aging infrastructure. Um, it's it's a, a separate surcharge for infrastructure purposes. I assume that that would, money would just go into the E&R fund or the extension and replacement fund, um, but they can speak to that. So when we did the, the rate study, one thing we wanted to make very clear to, the, to our customer base was where their money was going to go. So the 10 percent water fee and the 10 percent sewer fee, we put that on, on the, in the bill, essentially, to show people that we are, we are in the direct process of replacing old infrastructure. Because if you all remember on our presentation, 65 percent of our water pipes are older than 40 years and 58 percent of our sewer pipes are older than 40 years. So this money was, we wanted to demonstrate with, with clarity that's where that 10 percent was going to go, to replace water pipes that are old. The 10 percent on the sewer side was to replace sewer pipes that were old. That way we were, we provided as clearly as we could where that money was going to go. And that's where that 10 percent comes from for both sides. You, you, you really don't have to delineated that that specifically because you can build it into the rates without having that delineation but we wanted to have that to be clear about number one the need for it and number two the fact that we were going to dedicate it specifically to that thank you council member virtue so Claire, uh, I'll call you Claire, I'm sorry, <laughs> so Chair, <laughs> Chair, what I just heard was that th this rate increase primarily is, is dedicated to replacing old infrastructure on both the water and, and sewer side, that this, that this rate increase doesn't position the water department um, to have a reserve and to service this city in the event something catastrophic should, should occur. That's, that's what I just heard. Well, uh, two things that and we can ask Mr. Potter for clarification. I think, I'm, I, w I think we should be careful about the word dedicate because I think what we heard from Mr. Cooper is there is absolutely no dedicating to anything. There's bond documents that dictate how funds um, flow. Um, so it's, it's the intent that it's adequate to uh, pay for those things, but it would, I think, be incorrect to think of it as dedicated. Is that right, Mr. Cooper? I'm, I'm only using that language because of how the bill is, is to an actual consumer on the, other, on, on, on the, the end user of, of the actual bill. They, yeah. the, the end user, the consumer, doesn't know anything about bonds and anything that we discuss here. When they get their itemization of their bill and they see their charges, that's, that's how they, it relates to them as the, for, the, for the fee increase. So I, I get what you're saying here. Yeah. Um, and then the other part of your comment that uh, about the uh, um, there's uh, I forget the exact words you use, but there's um, 
the rate increase doesn't take into account um, uh, catastrophic events. I, I don't think that's entirely accurate, is it? I don't think that's entirely accurate because if you go back to how we do our capital planning, basically, we have a five-year capital plan. I mean, in actuality, we have a 20-year long-range plan on both the water and the sewer side that we update every five years. We have a five-year plan that we update every year, and then we have the one-year capital spending plan. So within the one-year plan, the five-year plan, and the 20-year plan, there's built-in flexibility to, to enable us to respond exactly that way. Because we can, if we see a, a capital demand that we didn't anticipate as a result of a disaster over the, that's not immediate, then we can take our capital plan and adjust it accordingly over the five-year period. And the whole rate structure is built on the one-year, the five-year, and the 20-year long-range capital plan for both the water and the sewer side. So it's all built in there as, as far as how we built the rates. And I'll go back to my, the additional funds provides us additional insurance. Council Lady, Virtue. Uh, I have not, nothing further, Chair. We're, we're going around in circles on one hand, um, the director is saying they need it. On the other hand, he's saying they don't need it. One instance is built in. Another instance is not is not built in. We're, we're, we're going around in, in circles with well, it. I, I think the the I think the summary is um, that as proposed, they feel like they've got the risk to the city adequately covered, and um, and. So what, whatever that risk is, um, there's always some potential of having a catastrophe that overwhelms the cash position of the department. And adding this, well, while they propose a, a set of rates that they consider an adequate risk that gives them adequate uh, ability to cover expected um, uh, uh, catastrophes, problems, damage, um, more is always better. And you, you heard him say that we could raise it to 50% surcharge and it wouldn't eliminate all their risk. We're just talking about shades of gray and how much risk to eliminate. And um, uh, Mr. Glover, I, I know I said I'd hold you to last, but it's been- I think just fundamentally, Chair, is, is, is us as a body, um, how we want to position this department to, to service the city. Do we Are we okay with the proposed um, rate increase for adequate risk your words and the department and the director's words or do we want to position this department to be in a position in the event something were to occur um they would be able to address it um even more better be in a better position to to address it so i think that's a really fair summary i'm going to um, move to mr glover and then there's still two other people after that but you've been waiting a while well if you want to take that all right uh, then i'll go to council member syracuse Thank you, Chair. Does this uh, proposed additional? Sorry, that's okay. Um, does this additional rate proposal add to other departments, including schools? Yes, it would be for all rate payers. All right, um, Councilmember Porterfield. Thank you, Chair. The five percent is it five percent to water and five percent to sewer? Yes, ma'am. So the fifty to two dollars would be a dollar to four dollars. I think they. I think that was no, combined. That's, total, that's combined. Okay, thank you. And then my last question: um, Can this five percent be used for anything else, such as payroll or anything, any additional things that we do not foresee? Yeah. So I, the answer is we we can't restrict it. However. <clears throat> Since the proposed rate structure is supposed to be sufficient to cover all of their operating costs, this money would not go for that. This money would flow down through to the surplus fund. So it, we, legally, you, you can't limit it, but in reality, it would not be needed for that purpose. Thank you. Councilmember Benedict. Thank you, Chair. So in uh, looking at the ordinance, it builds in an automatic increase in the rates of 4% in 2021, an additional 3% in 2022. 
et cetera. Would this 5% be on top of that? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And Mr. Glover. Okay, thank you, Chair. So one of the questions that we really can't answer, I don't think, and Mr. McGuire, unless you've got a calculator there, you can smack out an answer real fast. Um, so let's assume we don't have the emergency. We don't have another May 2020 event. And I think it's safe to say none of us want it, and, and I hope that we do not have it. Um, and so what this would do, it would free up money to pay cash for things versus taking a bond. So now with the uh, chair, if I may, and, and I don't know if I need to ask Mr. McGuire or someone at water because of, of where the bonds actually fall into uh, on when we borrow the money. If we took out a $20 million bond, as an example, what would be the typical payback length as far as number of years? Go ahead. The bonds we are taking out typically are about 30-year bonds. 30-year bonds, okay. So if we took out a $20 million bond uh, and paid it back over a 30-year period under today's interest environment, um, would we be able to recapture that, let's just call it uh, $24 a month for the first couple of years and then, then quote, it would stop? But it wouldn't. It wouldn't require us to uh, take out an additional twenty million in bonds. Would it? Would it be a safe assumption we could probably recapture that money because we paid cash as opposed to putting it on the credit card? I know it's hypothetical, but unfortunately, that's what we're playing in on on, on this bill. Go ahead, this Mr. McGuire, and then I, I've got a, another hypothetical for you. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think that would be a safe assumption. Unfortunately, my calculator doesn't attribute for changing interest rate environments. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> which, of course, could look like anything. So. Yeah, and, and the challenge is, because I want to address the payroll piece and, and a couple of other things. Obviously, when I began discussing this with Mr. Cooper, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Cooper, I mean, we put in there specifically on the amendment, it could not be used for payroll, could not be, you know, it had to be used for specific things. And then when you had the conversation with the bond council this morning, we were told, no, you can't do it. So this really goes back to kind of the, the pinky shake. So, you know, whether we do it or we don't, uh, if we don't have a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic event, then we obviously, the rate that's been proposed is sufficient. If we did have a catastrophic event, this just gives us a bit more cushion. But the other thing it does is it tries, and, and frankly, as I was thinking through every aspect of the amendment and why I would even dream of proposing something like this and why we put in the sunset on it was because I felt mathematically that over a long period of time, paying cash for something versus putting it on the, the credit card and paying for it over a long period of time would probably be a little easier uh, hit on us in the long run as we're seeing right now in the city because of our debt service. So that was part of my thinking uh, to where it was not uh, an additional amount of money that was literally going to be a make or break you because I'm, I'm certainly not interested in doing that. If we pass this, all it's doing, and again, we're talking hypothetical on if we have another uh, 2010 event, um, but as I'll say, and I'll say it again, I was here when it occurred. Um, you know, I was on the school board at the time, but believe me, we were watching every aspect and I was seeing how, how things were, were changing drastically rapidly. And so therefore, uh, that's what made me think about that particular instant uh, instance, excuse me. And then the second part of that is if it's not used, and we hope it's not used for that particular uh, measure, then it would be able to be utilized to pay cash versus the borrowing. So I tried to put in as many fail safes as possible with this. Uh, and then the final fail safe was if it's not needed in a few years, the same council doesn't have to renew it and it goes away and your bills go back down. So with that, uh, Chair, I, I think I pretty much so wrapped up my, my thoughts and my philosophies behind it. And, you know, we'll, uh, uh, if it passes, fine. If it doesn't, let's see where we land. 
one thing I, I do want to add one thing though you talk about one penny out of the pocket yeah you and i will have a conversation and we'll all have a conversation on the property tax piece uh, on the essentials versus the luxury this certainly is not uh, a, a, you know it, this is not what i would put in as an essential this is more of the the insurance product uh, just in the event something happens catastrophic in the first couple of years. So thank you, Chair. Um, thanks. And, and just because um, you, you raised one point, I, I, I don't want to belabor this, but it, Mr. Potter, if we raise this fund and the idea was to use it for emergencies, I assume it would be kept uh, liquid as opposed to any sort of long-term investment? I'm going to let my CFO. Yeah, yes, sir. If we it, obviously we'll be using cash and cash outright to to address any. And and these days, what, what's what what are you guys getting on uh, fully liquid assets, interest wise? Like almost nothing. It's whatever the MIP is getting, um, and Mr. McGuire might be able to respond to that more aptly than I because it change obviously it changes, but no yeah. more than two. Yeah, so it, it's, I mean, part of my thinking about this is, I mean, it, it is easy to dwell on the super low probability event where it clearly reduces risk. But in the most likely scenario, um, we have, I forget, was it 20 or 50 million uh, of taxpayer money um, sitting around earning 2% as to avoid a risk of borrowing in the event of a catastrophic situation. It's not, it's not 100% clear to me that getting, um, tens of millions of taxpayer money to sit around liquid earning 2% is um, a great idea. And again, I'm, I'm torn on it. Obviously, a bunch of us are torn on it. Well, don't quote me on that number. I mean, we, can, we can get that for you. All right. Um, well, there's nobody else in the queue. Um, and uh, so I have no idea how this vote's going to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're probably going to need a show of hands. So um, uh, 2019, uh, Dash 45. We're talking about the amendment um, that uh, is not in the amendments package, um, and uh, we'll do a show of hands. All in favor of it, raise your hand. And um, all opposed, raise your hand. And um, so that's two in favor and six opposed. I had three in favor. I'm, I'm sorry, three in favor. The opposed, raise your hands again. And three in favor, six opposed. Who's, who's the, in favor, the third in favor? I counted three hands. Who are the three in favor? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. Um, so the amendment uh, fails. Um, so we're back on the bill as originally proposed. Um, and uh, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on that? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We recommend 2019-45 um, for approval. Thank you. And there's nothing else on the agenda. Um, have a good evening. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.